Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to Challenges of Elevated Temperature Tensile Testing for Aerospace Metals, sponsored by Instron. My name is Bob Brockler. I'm the webinar coordinator with ASM International, and we are very, very happy that uh, you all could join us today. If you have any technical difficulties today, dial 877-582-7011. This will connect you directly to a uh, GoToWebinar technician, and I'll drop that number in the chat in just a few moments as well, uh, so you'll have it there. All of our participants are going to be in a listen-only mode during the presentation. Please feel free to use the questions window to submit questions at any time. And we're going to get to as many questions as we can at the uh, end of the presentation. For more than 100 years, ASM International has served the materials community by providing scientific, engineering, and technical information, as well as education, networking, and professional development. Advanced Materials and Processes is ASM's flagship technical magazine. The Tabby Award-winning magazine provides must-have information about leading-edge developments and trends in engineering materials. The magazine also covers emerging technologies, such as nanotechnology, additive manufacturing, and management topics. Don't miss current metals and materials industry happenings with AM and PE News, a bi-weekly e-newsletter. Subscribe for the premiere and technical content online at asminternational.org. Should also mention that registration is now open for IMAP, the annual ASM International meeting. This year's event will be held from September 30th through October 3rd in Cleveland, Ohio. You can find out more at imatevent.org. And again, I'll drop that uh, URL in the chat uh, in just a moment. Today's webinar sponsor is Instron. Founded in 1946, Instron is the recognized worldwide market leader in the materials testings industry. Instron systems evaluate the mechanical properties of materials and structures using tensile uh, compression, flexural fatigue, impact dynamic, torsoric, torsional, and multi-axial loading. Through a global infrastructure, Instron offers a broad range of local service capabilities, including calibration, verification, training, technical support, and assistance with laboratory management. Our first speaker today is going to be Dean Lovewell. He is the Metals Market Manager at Instron. He has degrees in Materials Science and Engineering and Mechanical Engineering from the University of Pittsburgh. He's also an active member of various ASTM and, and ISO standards committees for metals. Dean will be followed by Casey Willis. Casey is an Applications Engineer at Instron, specializing in high force testing for metals applications. Before I turn this presentation over to Dean Level, I do want to, uh, Dean Lovewell, I do want to note that there are some, uh, there's some collateral material in the handouts section of our webinar player. Specifically, you'll find two product brochures uh, for some of the equipment that will be discussed today. So I definitely recommend downloading those documents as we move along today. And with that, I will turn this presentation over to Dean Lovewell from Instron. All right, thank you, Bob, uh, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar and spending some time with us today. Uh, my name is Dean Lovewell, and I am the Metals Market Manager here at Instron. At Instron, we manufacture equipment that's used for mechanical testing for various materials in various conditions for lots of reasons, from research to quality control. Now, one of the more specialized areas that we operate in is the testing of aerospace alloys at elevated temperatures. To perform this testing well, it's important not only to have the right testing configuration, but also to have a firm understanding of what's happening to metallic materials at higher temperatures. Now, the difference in behavior of metals at high temperatures changes the way that we test them. This is, of course, obvious just by looking at the equipment. There's a furnace, and you have to figure out how to capture strain data with a specimen inside of a furnace. Um, but there's some other non-obvious differences as well. For example, we know that the stiffness of metal changes much more significantly at the yield point for metals tested at elevated temperatures. And this has implications on the data we capture and how we capture it. And that's just one example. The purpose of our discussion today is to talk through some of the more challenging aspects of elevated temperature testing of metals. And whether you're already performing this type of testing or you're considering adding this to your lab's capability, I hope to address elements that can guide your thinking as to the best approach. 
Now, as for my role at Instron, uh, as the metals market manager, my most important responsibility is to ensure that the products we produce are well suited to the needs of our metals testing customer, customers. To do that, I spend a lot of time with our existing customers, understanding the challenges and trends that we see in the market. One of the biggest drivers we see today in the high temperature testing market for producers is a desire to bring more testing closer to production to enable faster qualification of parts. As for the research and development space, we generally see a need for hotter and hotter testing of increasingly strong complex alloys. Hopefully in this webinar, there's a little something for everyone, but if we happen to miss your specific need, please go ahead and drop a question and we'll either respond after the presentation or in follow-up soon after. Now, a little about the picture I've chosen here. This is actually the nozzle exit, or what we would call the business end of a solid fuel rocket motor, used to give an extra boost for satellite placement vehicles. In applications like this one, metallic structural components must continue to maintain strength at high temperatures in order to carry a load without failure or deflection. So this satellite placement vehicle uses multiple boosters shown in the previous pictures, and any deflection or failure of the structural metal in this rocket risks enormous financial loss uh, and could potentially risk lives as well. And this is true in many elevated temperature applications, especially in aerospace, uh, where the environments can be extreme and the tolerances can be quite narrow. One of the trends we're seeing in aerospace today is increasing service temperature for jet engine parts. This is because jet engines operate much more efficiently with better fuel economy at higher temperatures. So on today's agenda, we'll first start by talking about the standards associated with mechanical testing at elevated temperatures. Testing standards certainly influence how our equipment is used. So in addition to collaborating with our customers on the next generation of testing solutions, I participate actively alongside several other Instron engineers on standards committees that impact elevated temperature testing. This includes ISO Technical Committee 164, Subcommittee 1, Working Group 4, uh, this is the working group responsible for the ISO standard on elevated temperature testing, um, as well as ASTM International Committee E28, uh, which governs their corresponding standard uh, on high temperature testing. Since one of the recurring topics in this webinar is strain control, we'll be sure to address the extensometers commonly used in elevated temperature testing. We'll then cover load string considerations, including load strings for high throughput testing. And then we'll finish up by addressing some of the questions you sent in earlier, uh, as well as during this webinar. Now, the two most commonly used international testing standards belong to the International Organization for Standardization, uh, or ISO, and ASTM International. ASTM International was formerly known as ASTM, which stood for the American Society of Testing and Materials. However, in 2001, ASTM underwent a formal renaming to become ASTM International. Uh, and in this process, they were de-emphasizing their ex exclusive focus on the American market and expanding their application to the international market. So for that reason, along with broadening global supply chains, we increasingly see requirements for ASTM E21, as well as ISO 6892-2 around the world. Now, although their standards tend to agree in practice, there are some key differences between these organizations. An important one is how they vote. While ISO operates similar to the United Nations, with each country getting one vote, ASTM instead designates one vote per company. 
One interesting provision in the ASTM voting process is that any person, regardless of company, country, or even membership affiliation, can attend a meeting online or in person and register a negative comment on a proposed change. Once a negative comment is registered, one of two things will happen. Either your comment will be used to inform the standard in a way that you agree with, uh, or two thirds of the voting membership would be required to determine the comment was non-persuasive. So knowing this, it's important to remember the value of your voice if you see the standards changing in a way that isn't suitable to your process or in a way that you disagree with. As for staying on top of the standards and how they're potentially changing, a great way to do that is to attend programs like this. So in that respect, you're already one step ahead. Congratulations. Uh, the other way is to join the standards community yourself uh, where you can attend annual ISO meetings around the world or biannual ASTM meetings in North America uh, where these standards are discussed uh, in great detail. Now, most of what we discussed today will use language specific to the ISO 6892-2 standard. This is certainly the more widely used standard around the world and although it differs in some ways from ASTM E21, they do align very closely. Uh, now the normative reference for this standard is ISO 6892-1. By normative, I mean that the procedures outlined in 6892-2 are derived from those prescribed in 6892-1. The purpose of this standard, 6892-2, is to outline only what is different for elevated temperature testing. One of the current discussions going on at ISO uh, is a change that would clarify what mechanical properties are within the scope of this standard. Currently, the standard actually references several mechanical properties that aren't actually applicable to elevated temperature testing, uh, and you can find these in Clause 3 currently. Uh, this has led to some notable confusion. So once the new standard is released, expected later this year, one of the changes that we expect to see uh, is that it'll clarify the properties that are within the scope of the standard. This includes percentage of elongation after fracture, proof strength, tensile strength, uh, and potentially reduction of area as well. There's, there's some discussion on that one. Uh, these, these changes haven't been made yet, but I, I would expect them in the next publication. Uh, and then looking at ASTM E21, uh, this standard was originally approved uh, in 1933, back when ASTM was primarily an American organization. Um, so it's around, been around for quite a while. Uh, the previous version was published in 2017, and the most recent edition was published in 2020. Subcommittee E2804, uh, which I belong to, meets twice a year to discuss opportunities for improvement. Um, however, not much activity is expected for this particular standard. In recent meetings, we've discussed providing clarification for retests within the standard, that is providing some guidance uh, for when retests should be conducted and what process should be followed in doing them. However, the E28 committee agrees that any update here would actually belong in the normative standard E8, uh, since retests also apply to ambient temperature testing. So as you can probably tell from the description of those updates, both the ASTM and ISO standards on elevated temperature testing are fairly mature. So when there are changes, they tend to be small clarifying ones designed to improve the ease of use for the laboratories rather than big sweeping technical changes that would influence the equipment or test methods used. Now, one key difference between these two standards is that ISO 6892-2 requires a much narrower control of strain rate for the primary range of the standard, and that's where yield properties are determined. Although they both set the same target, 
ISO 6892-2 requires plus or minus 20% adherence to that target, whereas ASTM allows up to 40%. This is very important to consider when you're building out your lab for high temperature testing. Of course, it's important to understand the testing requirements you have today uh, in selecting your equipment, but if you're currently only testing the ASTM E21 today, and there's a chance that you might grow into ISO 6892-2 requirements, it's a good idea to consider how you might need to adapt if your requirements change. We'll talk more about the challenges in maintaining good strain control later in the webinar. Now, on the earlier slides, I noted the scope of these elevated temperature testing standards is actually anything over 35 degrees Celsius for ISO uh, or 38 degrees Celsius for ASTM International. However, when discussing aerospace alloys, we're typically talking about metals that are tested at much higher temperatures. This is because when we look at a, a common application, um, for example, the components aft of the compressor in a jet engine, the service temperatures exceed 1,000 degrees Celsius. And the common trend in industry is increasing both the relative load and service temperature of metals in this application. This is where we really worry not only about the ability of metallic components to carry load at temperature, but also to do so with well understood minimum deflections. So, one of the things that I've found is that when setting up your high temperature testing equipment, it's really helpful to understand what's going on with the material itself as you heat it up and run your test. So let's take a look at how the mechanical properties are actually changing as the temperature increases. We know that increasing temperature of the metal increases the vibration of atoms in the crystal structure. As they vibrate, this increases their atomic distance. And because the distance between the atoms is greater, the atomic force that holds them together is weaker. Now, since the slope of the elastic region in a stress strain curve is in, a, is in effect a direct measurement of this atomic force, we expect to see a decrease in, in, in the modulus as the temperature of a metal increases. This is why we see a flattening of the stress strain plot, as is depicted in the left illustration on this slide. Studies on martensitic stainless steels have shown the relationship to be about five gigapascals per 100 degrees Celsius. Um, this is a good guiding point, but the relationship is of course very much affected on the particular alloy being tested and the temperature range that it's being studied or qualified for. Something else that we see as temperature increases is that materials that exhibit discontinuous yielding behavior at ambient temperature will instead show continuous yielding. Now, the metallurgical reason for this is that the needle-like martensitic microstructure that causes discontinuous yielding uh, will transform at higher temperatures as the carbides in those needles precipitate uh, out into the matrix of the metal. At ambient temperature, these needle-like structures create pinning and flow behavior that leads to peaks and troughs in the stress strain curve. This is apparent in the gray stress strain curve in the right illustration, but with the carbon diffused into the matrix, the ductile material flows much easier. These pin-like structures don't uh, don't impede anymore. So more simply put, the structure of the metal itself takes on a softer form that is much easier to flow as the metal stretches. Now, Annex B of ISO 6892-2 provides some terrific visuals of how materials behave differently at high temperatures. In this first figure, we consider five tests of the same alloy as measured at increasing temperatures. Like I mentioned on the last slide, the slope of the elastic region starts to flatten out 
as the material has less stiffness. The higher the temperature, the greater the atomic distance, and the weaker the forces between the atoms. So less force is needed to stretch the atoms out. Another thing that we see is that the onset of plastic deformation occurs at lower stresses. This makes sense. It makes sense for the same reason as the modulus is lower. Because the atomic forces are weaker, they'll be easier to break. And so less force is required for the same specimen to break those bonds. Another thing that we see in high temperature testing is the results will typically exhibit higher elongation. This is because the softer material is more ductile. And so of course it'll exhibit less brittle failure uh, than it would at ambient temperatures. The increased portion of ductile failure translates directly to longer elongation of the specimen. ISO 6892-2 provides an additional set of figures uh, which shows the increased strain rate sensitivity of materials at high temperatures. The figure on the left shows an alloy that was tested with varied strain rate at room temperature. Yield sensitive properties varied up to 10%, which can be problematic when comparing lab to lab results. But as you see on the right, it's far more significant at high temperatures. And this effect increases the higher the temperature gets. These two figures show how important it is, particularly in elevated temperature testing, to control for strain rate in order to get reliable, repeatable results. So while the normative reference, ISO 6892-1, articulates three valid control methods, that is controlling by strain rate, stress rate, or extension, ISO 6892-2 instructs that strain rate must be controlled in testing in order to get a conforming result. There are two methods that are provided in the standard. The first is method A, uh, which is most commonly used in elevated temperature testing. This method prescribes a lower strain rate than the normative standard, so the test must be run at a much slower speed to maintain the result. The second method is not as commonly used in production environments, but because it uses the same strain rate as 6892-1, it enables direct comparison between the alloy at elevated and ambient temperatures. So we see this in academic and research centers uh, quite often, but again, less common in production testing to qualify parts. Now ASTM E21 takes a different approach in describing these methods. Unlike 6892, instead of the ranges existing in the elevated standard, instead they're specified in the ambient temperature standard with the slower rate corresponding to aerospace alloys at ambient temperature and all alloys at elevated temperatures. Now, across both standards, we see that elevated temperature testing occurs at slower strain rates, typically 0 0.005 millimeter per millimeter per minute. It's a little difficult to visualize what that means in terms of controlling the frame, though. So we've created this diagram here uh, where we take the target strain rate for various tests and convert that into allowable crosshead speeds for those tests. On the left, we have two ambient temperature tests, one ASTM E8 and one ISO 6892-1. Their target strain rates are the same, both 0 0.015 millimeter per millimeter per minute. However, the allowable crosshead speeds are slightly different. You'll notice there's actually a greater tolerance for variation in crosshead speed for the ISO test because the gauge length is larger. Now, when we look at the elevated temperature tests on the right, notice how narrow the window of crosshead speeds is for E21. And it's even smaller for testing to ISO. This is what really drives the need for closed loop strain control in high temperature testing. Because of course, remember, it's not just that you need to find the right crosshead speed for your target strain rate. You also need to ensure that it's appropriate 
for the stiffness of the specimen, which can change from alloy to alloy, making it very difficult to identify the correct speed. You'll notice there's one set of speeds outside of the typical range of hot tensile testing. That belongs to ISO 6892-2 method B testing, which when you compare to the range on the left, there's a lower, there's a narrower range uh, of conforming speeds than the ambient test due to the smaller gauge length of high temp specimens. Um, and again, with method B, that's typically something that we see more often with research uh, or academic settings. So we just looked at how crossfed speeds vary between ambient and elevated temperature tests. Now let's consider the effect that gauge length has. On the left, we see that whether testing in ISO or ASDM, there's a much larger window of conforming speeds compared to the tighter range on the right. This highlights the difficulty of testing smaller specimens in strain control at elevated temperatures. Despite that difficulty though, it's quite common in industry. Aerospace alloys are of course expensive. And so any opportunity to reduce the amount of material to be extracted is going to be welcomed. For an additive manufacturer, that could mean printing less material for specimens. In the forging industry, using a smaller specimen might enable you to extract from a porthole of an adapter ring instead of adding an expensive prolongation. Typically, the cost savings in that operation uh, will exceed the cost of equipping your test frame to be able to test that size of specimen. But it's an important thing to consider ahead of time before the specimens start arriving in your lab. So although we would always recommend using a larger gauge length when possible, sometimes it just makes sense from a cost standpoint. Uh, or sometimes you only have so much material to even source a specimen out of. So in many cases, the smaller specimen is still going to be either desirable or necessary. Now, if you're in a position where you use a 25 millimeter gauge length specimen, but you're not equipped to do closed loop strain control, the standard does allow using crosshead displacement control. As long as you choose a speed that results in a conforming strain rate at the determination of yield properties. As illustrated here, that can be tricky. Beginning of the test. We see that here in an illustration of a strain controlled test. The crosshead ramps up at the beginning of the at the beginning until the target strain rate is achieved. And then it slows down as the material softens, maintaining that desired strain rate while yield properties are determined. In crosshead speed controlled tests, the slow speed that is used to achieve the target strain rate at yield will actually be used throughout the beginning of the test. This will lead to the test taking significantly longer. And just to point out again, there's a very narrow window of crosshead speeds that will produce a conforming strain result. And this window shifts depending on the stiffness of the specimen. So just to summarize here, good strain control is critical for achieving a conforming test to either ASTM E21 or ISO 6892-2. And that control is even more important for specimens of smaller gauge lengths. And although the standards allow for testing in open loop control, if closed loop isn't obtainable with your equipment, that presents other challenges, including the increased likelihood that retests will be needed uh, and a slower test overall. Both of these challenges can really get in the way of the efficacy of a test lab. So how do we achieve conforming strength control? Well, there's a lot of solution providers in the market that claim to support strain control, but many will rely on a procedure like this. That is, they'll provide a series of steps to identify a single gain setting. And if you're asking yourself, what's a gain setting? Don't worry, you're not alone. This is not a commonly adjusted parameter in testing. 
The gain setting is used to tell the test frame how much it needs to move the crosshead in order to strain the specimen. When following a typical procedure, identifying a gain setting, you'll run a test in the elastic region, comparing the extension of the crosshead against the tensile extension of the specimen. The ideal gain setting will then be the slope of the curve, indicating that you need to move the crosshead Y amount in order to get X extension of the specimen. The effect is much like trying to maintain the same speed while driving a car up a hill. If you're trying to go 45 miles per hour, but you're only going 40, you need to give quite a bit of gas to get your speed up. In that way, a steep hill is like a stiff specimen. Now consider when you drive over the crest of the hill and you've reached a plateau. You no longer need the same amount of acceleration to get your speed up. In fact, if you were to apply the same amount of gas as you applied while you were on the hill, you're going to far overshoot your goal. This is much like what happens when a specimen yields. The hill is no longer steep, so you need a different approach to the gas pedal in the same way that you need a different gain setting. This is the core problem with using a single gain setting. We know that metal specimens, specimens soften significantly as they yield, an effect that's even more pronounced at elevated temperatures. So the gain setting that's appropriate at the beginning of the test when the specimen is stiff will be far too high once the material starts yielding. This is one of the reasons why tests can go out of control. When using a gain setting that's too high, the frame might sound like it's buzzing and the strain rate strain plot will show that the strain rate is not being tightly controlled around the target. Unfortunately, Using a very small gain setting isn't the solution either. If you're using a small gain setting, that results in the frame making insufficient adjustments, the frame won't respond fast enough to keep close to the goal strain rate. When you look at the strain rate strain plot for a test with a gain setting that's too low, it'll seem like it's wandering past the goal and potentially going out of bounds before finding its, its way back again. Um, so for repeatable, reliable, high temperature tests, neither of these options would be acceptable, which is why we don't recommend using a single gain setting uh, for a strain control elevated temperature test. So what do we recommend? Well, included in Instron 6800 frames is a feature called automatic loop control. We recommend choosing this instead of a single gain setting because automatic loop control enables continuous adjustments to the gain setting in response to the changing stiffness of the material. This takes all the guesswork and trial and error out of trying to identify a gain setting that works for both the elastic and plastic region of the test. This feature is especially useful if you're testing different alloys. Nickel alloys such as Inclinel 718 or 625 uh, have a much more pronounced decrease in stiffness through yield than ferrous alloys like 4340 or 300M. By using automatic loop control, you can follow your same test parameters, not only from specimen to specimen of a single alloy, but you can also accommodate the difference in behavior from one alloy to the next. Now, if you'd like to learn more, um, there's a lot more information built into Blue Hill Universal's help directory. I included this snippet from our help directory, not only because it contains useful information on automatic loop control, but also as a reminder that it's there. Even as a material science engineer who's been working in the industry for years, I still learn things from reviewing the directory. So if you're testing and you run into questions, this is a great place to check first. Uh, and to access that, uh, the blue, the, to access the Blue Hill Help Directory, just click the question mark, uh, which is at the right corner of any screen. So now we're gonna look at some of the equipment options for high temperature testing. And as I've talked a lot about strain control already, uh, I think extensometers are a great place to start. There are two basic 
types of contacting extensometers. There are cold mounted extensometers and hot mounted ones. Uh, as the name implies, cold mounted extensometers need to be attached before the specimen is brought to temperature. This is because they use heat resistant fabric cords to keep the extensometer on the specimen. So for this reason, they're often referred to as self-supported extensometers. Hot mounted extensometers, on the other hand, are supported by a rigid mounting external to the load string, typically attached to the frame. More preparation is needed with this type of extensometer because the height and alignment all need to be set so that the extensometer arms reliably meet the specimen inside the furnace. However, the benefit of this type is that you don't need your extensometer in contact with the specimen while it's heating up and soaking, uh, which is important for allowing multiple furnaces for high throughput testing. Now, for both cold mounted and hot mounted extensometers, you'll want to equip with the correct tips for your specimen. Uh, if you're testing both round and flat specimens, the straight chisel can accommodate both. Um, however, if you're only testing one or the other, it really makes sense to optimize here. If you're only testing flat specimens, the conical tip is recommended because it reduces the risk of multiple engagement points from each arm. Uh, and if you're using round specimens, the V chisel is recommended. Uh, the groove of this style allows for self-alignment of the arm on the specimen, uh, which can improve, improve the fit for each test. So taking a closer look at a self-supported extensometer, uh, this is one of the most popular models that we see. It's simple and cost effective, and the 50 millimeter or two inch gauge length version is really well suited for strain control testing to ASTM E21. For smaller gauge lengths, it can be more difficult, uh, as we discussed earlier, and trying to meet 6892-2 with this extensometer is not recommended. In those applications, you'll want to upgrade to one of the hot mountable units. But again, if you're testing 50 millimeters or two inch gauge lengths to ASTM E21, or if you plan to strictly use crosshead control, this is a perfectly suitable option. One challenge though that I, I want to point out, um, and it's associated with this extensometer being used with improved efficiency furnaces, um, uh, the best way to improve the efficiency of a furnace is, of course, to limit as much as possible opportunities for heat to escape. Uh, this includes reducing the opening where a side entry extensometer enters. If you're not careful, the nylon cords that hold up the extensometer can rub against the refractory of the furnace. This might not be as notable in, uh, noticeable in small strains observed in the elastic region, but once the specimen starts to yield, the problem will become quite clear, as you can see in this zoomed in stress strain plot on the left. If you're not familiar with this type of challenge, this can be difficult to actually observe because the interference is so slight. But now that you know this, you can very easily modify the furnace to adapt to the six sensometer or if you wanna get the most benefit from your high efficiency furnace, you can of course upgrade to a hot mountable one. Hot mounted extensometers are supported by a rigid structure outside of the load string. So you remove the need for nylon cords and can take full advantage of the narrow side entry ports in modern efficient furnaces. One of the most common hot mounted extensometers we see uh, is this one here, the E3549. With the improved stabilization that comes with the rigid mounting, this is not only easier to use test after test, but it also controls well enough to perform both ISO 6892-2 and ASTM E21 strain control testing for specimens with a 50 millimeter gauge length. This extensometer also comes with water cooling, uh, which is recommended for testing over 900 degrees Celsius.
Uh, and lastly, we have the 7650A extensometer. This one is suitable for ASTM E21, as well as ISO 6892-2 uh, for strain control in both 50 millimeter and 25 millimeter gauge lengths. So a quick review on the extensometers we discussed. If you're only testing to ASTM E21 with a 50 millimeter gauge length in string control, or if you're using crosshead control, then the cold mounted E3448 extensometer is a great cost effective solution. The next step up is upgrading to a hot mountable extensometer like E3549, which affords the additional benefit of being able to test to 6892-2 in string control for 50 millimeter gauge length specimens, um, as well as getting more efficiency out of modern furnaces. Uh, and then finally, if you're testing the 6892-2 with smaller gauge length specimens, you'll benefit the most from the improvements found in 7650A. Now, with that, uh, I'll pass the presentation over to Casey Willis to discuss some load strain considerations. Thanks, Dean. And with that, we'll jump right into the load string. Next slide. Now for specimen types, there are two common types of specimen geometries for testing at elevated temperatures. The first being threaded end connection shown on the upper left image. This is used for round specimens. This can be configured to either US or metric threading. Just below that is an example of a pin and clevis style connection, which is used for flat specimens. On the specimen, you can see a slot machine for the pin. This is labeled as callout A. And on the holder next to that specimen, you'll see callout B, which corresponds to the thickness of the specimen. The ratio of A to B here is very important to get a more reliable connection and minimize the chance of misalignment, we always recommend that you use a pin that is equal to or greater than the thickness of your specimen. Some customers who test flat specimens choose to use wedge style grips. Those, these are acceptable for high temperature testing. The design of the wedge pocket can become unreliable at these temperatures. As a result, you might see the grips losing clamping pressure, which might to lead to your specimen slipping during the test. In addition, there are some machining challenges for the materials used in those grips. So we see the majority of the industry using connection types that we outlined on this slide. Next slide, please. Next slide, Dean. Moving on to pull rods, you can see on the right, we have a visual for how the load string begins to be assembled. I'd like to uh, recommend adding anti-seize grease or lubricant to the ends of the specimens to prevent the chance of your specimen accidentally welding to the holder if you're using a threaded connection. The load string configuration typically consists of pull rods made from a high temperature resilient material, such as Inconel 713C, which has a relatively low thermal expansion. The specimen, the holders, and the pull rods are the parts of the load string that are going to be subjected to those extreme temperatures. So it might be advantageous to purchase spare pull rods and holders if you are a high throughput lab. This will allow you to immediately start another test without having to wait for your load string to come back down to a safe handling temperature to load the next specimen. Next slide, please. A time-saving design your lab could opt into could be using quick change adapters rather than a fixed load string. You can outfit the ends of the pull rods with a quick change washer. You can see the black washer called out with um, the arrow in the image on the left. Looking at the animation on the right, you can see the ends of the load string slide quickly into those adapters. These adapters have a spherical seat to help with alignment of your load string. Inside the quick change adapters, there's a recess which allows that washer to self-locate. Once the load string's in place, you can see the crosshead move up slightly, 
What this is, is a small preload that is being applied to remove any slack that might be in your load string. You may ask, is the preload necessary? And yes, we always recommend it. The reason being is as the spe specimen heats up, it will soften. So this might create slack in the load string and that presents an opportunity for misalignment. So having a preload just ensures that that washer is gonna stay fixed in the holder and won't slide around. Next slide, please. So to maintain alignment, what's kind of happening behind the scenes and how can your testing software actually help you prevent chances for misalignment? This is a screenshot from an elevated temperature test method set up in Blue Hill Universal. The way we configure our preload settings is we set the preload to force control. This means your load string will be held at a constant force for a set duration of time or until your temperature soaking criteria has been met. This ensures even if the load string deforms, the crosshead will automatically adjust to ensure it's maintaining that force that you specified. Next slide, please. And finally, wrapping up with the last part of the puzzle, you have your furnace. Instron offers a three zone furnace with a front exensometer entry point each zone is controlled with a type K thermocouple that is mounted to the center line of each zone. These can be individually set and controlled. Safety was definitely a priority when selecting this design. The entire exterior of the furnace has a heat shield to protect the operator from the extreme temperatures inside the furnace. Ceramic insulation lines the furnace's interior with ceramic blocks at the top and the bottom of the furnace. These blocks can actually be slid inwards to hug the pull rods that enter and exit the furnace. This helps prevent any unnecessary heat loss during the test. Our high grade ceramic insulation does not have the traditional RCF or refractory ceramic fiber, which can cause skin, eye, and respiratory problems with repeated exposure. The furnace itself sits on an adjustable mount that can be positioned to accommodate your specific system and load string. The mounting has a butterfly hinge, which allows you to easily swing the furnace in when it's needed for a high temperature test. And when the furnace is not being used, you can swing it out of the way, and that test space can actually be used for an ambient test setup. Next slide, please. Regardless of the standard body you're adhering to, whether it be ASTM or ISO, your lab is going to face the same obstacles as anybody else in the industry doing an elevated temperature test. A core requirement that is very clearly outlined in ISO 6892-2 and ASTM E8 is the requirement to meet soaking criteria. These standards state that your specimen must reach a specified temperature before the test begins. Once your furnace controller or testing software indicates that the specified temperature is met, that specimen temperature must be held within a tight tolerance uh, at that temperature for a set amount of time to ensure that entire specimen has reached equilibrium in its environment. We have a visual on the screen that shows you some heat up tests that we ran in the lab up to 1000 degrees Celsius. The temperature of both the furnace and the specimen were tracked during these tests. The red bar below the graph shows how long it took the specimen to come up to temperature. This will vary depending on the material type you're testing. You can see it takes a considerable amount of the overall test time. So if your lab is trying to complete multiples of these tests a day, you can see how this test duration quickly eats away at throughput. Next slide, please. So what are labs doing to overcome this time sink? The most common way I see customers optimizing their lab setup is outfitting their universal testing machines with two furnaces. High throughput test houses or laboratories favor this configuration because it allows them to have a temperature, um, a specimen soaking on the side while they're completing their primary test. Not only this, but it saves you on the cost of purchasing another universal testing machine. Once you've completed the test in your primary furnace, you can swing it out of the test space and bring in your second furnace and immediately start testing. For this configuration, we recommend using a hot mounted exensometer rather than a cold mounted one. <clears throat> 
This way you don't need two of the same X insometers in your lab because keep in mind, those need to be mounted while the specimen is cold or prior to the test. Uh, with the hot mountable X insometers, they typically sit on a roller, so you can just slide it out of the load string when you're switching furnaces and then bring it back in when you have your second furnace in place. We can go to the next slide. And with that, we would like to thank everybody for attending. And now Dean and I would be happy to answer any of the questions you might have. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for those excellent presentations, Dean Lovewell and Casey Willis. We'll now start taking some of the questions that we have from the audience, and we have quite a few, so we'll uh, we'll get to as many as we can. And I think I heard you say, Dean, that uh, you'll try and respond individually to the ones that we don't get to. I hope, sorry if I'm putting you on the spot there. Yeah, no, that's correct. Okay, yeah. good. So our first question, what anti-seize coatings for threads would you recommend? I can take uh, this one. So there isn't a specific brand that I would recommend, but you should definitely make sure that when you are purchasing the anti-seize grease or lubricant that you keep in mind your material and then your temperature range, because typically I see those kind of bucketed in different temperature ranges. So just keep that in mind before purchasing. Okay, thank you, Casey. Our next question, when working with test service providers, what are some things I can do to protect slash de-risk the integrity of the test results? Thanks, Bob. That, that's a great question. Um, and and we we hear that from, from our customers in aerospace testing and both elevated temperatures and ambient temperatures. Um, the, the truth is a quick search of data falsification events in, in mechanical testing will show quite a few cases where uh, the integrity of, of the data was lost, either because the, the result or the parameters that were used to achieve the result were modified after the test. Um, it's not only expensive to, to mitigate, but it's very damaging to the reputations of laboratories and um, and the, the producers that rely on them. So de-risking is, is something that Instron has been helping our customers do for, for years, quite frankly. Um, and the, our approach uh, and, and what we would recommend is maintaining a secure log of both the results and the parameters that were used to achieve the results and have that be a, a core component of your testing software. At Instron in Blue Hill Universal, we use a, a feature called revision history that automatically tracks uh, any revisions that are made to results or methods. So in the event of a, uh, a test result that doesn't seem quite right, um, you can go back and see exactly what parameters were used to achieve that. Uh, and you know we consider the integrity of, of the parameters to be just as important as the result. So that's revision history, and that's that's a way to look back um, to you know de-risk past tests. Uh, another approach that you can take uh, is is an additional module that that Instron offers called traceability. Uh, and what traceability does is it it requires authorization authorization from uh, from designated approvers before changes can be made that could affect the result. You know, something that we talked a lot about during this webinar is the effect that strain rate has uh, on, on, yield, on strain sensitive properties like yield. Um, and so by using revision history, you can look back at the strain rate that, that yield was determined at and using traceability, you can you can lock down the strain rates that are used in your strain control testing to have confidence not only in the accuracy of the result in the moment, the recorded result, uh, and the past history of the parameters. So great question. Okay, uh, thanks Dean. Our next question is ISO 6892-1 allows for controlling by stress rate method B. Is this allowed in ISO 6892-2? So I, I, I can take that one too. Um, 
So it's it is not permitted in 6892-2. Uh, like, like I pointed out during during the presentation, uh, stress rate is permitted uh, in the testing at ambient temperatures, um, but because of the the high degree of strain rate sensitivity and the fact that stress rate testing doesn't control for strain rate. Um, it's it's not permitted in elevated temperature testing, uh, frankly, because of the the repeatability issues that would occur, test to test, uh, frame to frame, and lab to lab. So that's why stress rate is not permitted in elevated temperature testing. Okay, thanks, Dean. Uh, next question: Are there high temperature versions of a clip-on ex extensometer? Um, I can take this one. There are uh, high temp versions of a clip-on extensometer. Uh, some even sit fully inside of the furnace, but we didn't choose to showcase that today because we've just seen um, not as many people uh, interested in those or using those in the field. So we just showcased our most popular ones. Okay, thanks Casey. Uh, next question, how do you address machine compliance in elevated temperature tensile testing? Yeah, so so uh, Casey Casey touched on that uh, a bit during the load string description. Um, we we very much recommend using a preload at the beginning of the test to take up the the not only the compliance of the frame, uh, but the relaxation in the load string uh, that can occur. Uh, compliance is something that you have to keep in mind even with ambient temperature testing. Uh, but with elevated temperature testing, uh, it's it's important it's important to take up that compliance uh, because you'll also need to take up the the slack that can occur in the load string uh, during the heat up and soak period. Okay, uh, so we're getting close to the top of the hour, but we still have a, a number of uh, questions in the queue. Maybe we can kind of do a lightning round on some of these. In fact, some of these look like kind of yes or no questions, so we'll go through some of these. Uh, I would like to know if Instron's, Instron builds the equipment ensuring that alignment is meeting the requirements of ASTM E1012, or would this require a special requirement for each customer? Um. Yeah, so I can take that. So yes, they they are built to eat to meet one zero one two. Um, this does require an on-site verification, though, um, as uh, as spelled out in the standard that mo moving the equipment um, after verification to e one zero one two requires a re-verification. So when we ship the product. Uh, it, it, of course, needs to be verified when it arrives. And if the equipment is moved, um, then it would need to be re-verified. Okay, next question is up to what temperature can we perform the elevated temperature test? I can take this one. Uh, typically, our furnaces operate in the just about above 1,000 degrees Celsius area. Um, but depending on what temperature you want your specimen to come up to, um, we have really strong partnerships within uh, the elevated temperature um, field, and we can work with one of our third-party vendors to get you a system that uh, conforms to your requirements. Thank you, Casey. Next question, preheating of furnace and then loading specimen, is, th is this the correct method? I, I can take this one. So what I, I think the question means is, uh, your furnace is heating up on the side and then right before you put the load string in. So that's actually not allowed um, if you're testing to 6892-2 or E21. You're going to want that specimen to come up to temperature and soak there. I think it's for about 20 minutes. Um, so as your furnace heats up, um, I'd recommend having your specimen in there or you're going to have to wait until the specimen temperature reaches um, equilibrium. Okay, let's. Uh, I think we have time for one last question here. Uh, is there a maximum bound on ramp slash soak time set by any standard, and what would you recommend? I think there's only a lower bound that the standards call out. I'm not familiar, Dean. Correct me if I'm wrong. If there's an upper bound. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, I, I think you, you stumped us there. Um, you know, typically, we see minimum requirements of 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, I, I do think there is a uh, an upper bound on that, but we'll we'll have to get back to you on that one. Or you can join an ASTM or ISO committee. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dean and Casey. Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer every question we received, but in a few days, all of our attendees today are going to receive an email, and that'll have some uh, some further contact information. And, and I encourage you to follow up with our speakers for more information uh, about this topic. Also, I want to remind you once again that there are a couple of downloadable documents in the handout section of the player. We still will probably be online for a couple more minutes. Uh, go ahead and grab those if you haven't grabbed them already. Once again, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsor of today's webinar, that's Instron. You can direct any general questions to instron.com slash enus slash our company slash contact us. And I'm going to drop that uh, into the chat in, in just a second. Uh, more information can be found at instron.com. And I encourage you to complete the brief survey that will appear on the screen as you exit the webinar. With your input, we can continue to provide webinars with high quality practical information that you can use. Thank you once again for participating in this ASM webinar and have a great day, everybody.